I believe I've mentioned this before, but in order to combat my terrible upload schedule the past couple years, I decided to do a sort of clean slate thing and finish every single video on my idea list before doing anything outside of it, just as a sort of way to start fresh. You've already seen the results of that because three of the last four videos I've made were all on that list. That is, Xenoblade games should have subtitles, why canonically are Xenoblade 2's tutorials bad, and the giant trails video that took a month to make. Obviously, the two news videos before and the one news video after those three were not planned or on the list because they were in response to some recent news, but besides that, I am continuously hacking away at that list. After today, I have four unscripted purely Xeno videos, two scripted purely Xeno videos, and the long-promised Smash Spirits of the Xenoblade series video that I think I talked about back when Ultimate first came out, but then eventually decided to wait until the end of the DLC because we might have gotten a new Xeno character, and it turned out that was a good idea because we got a new Xeno character, so I think I'll actually finish the entire list by the end of 2021. Why am I bringing up this list, though? Basically because there was supposed to be one other unscripted video on it, because someone already made that five months ago. The joke theory about Xenoblade 2's tutorials was originally supposed to be part one, and the second part was going to be a serious discussion on how to rework the tutorials in Xenoblade 2 to be better and generally more in line with the tutorials in 1 and X, if not outright surpassing them. Before I could get around to that, or even around to part 1, YouTuber Signet made a video called Fixing Xenoblade 2's Opening Hours that touches on the tutorials and restructures the gameplay of the first three chapters of the game, including spacing out tutorials and giving you different mechanics at different times in order to make the new experience better and more conducive to actually learning the combat system. Basically 95% of the points I was going to make in my video are in there, and all the points that weren't things I'd thought of I more or less agree with entirely, so instead of making a completely redundant video, I'm just going to direct you to that one, because it is criminally underviewed. Today's video, however, is sort of a spiritual successor to the tutorial fix video that I never made, because this is about fixing a different aspect of Xenoblade 2 that a lot of people complain about, that being the field skills, as well as an additional discussion on movement options to make exploring the world in future Xenoblade games more dynamic. I'm going to be keeping story spoilers as small as possible. Don't think there's going to be anything significant from Xenoblade X or 2, but I will have to mention something from Future Connected later on. However, I may be using footage of late game areas from Xenoblade 2, as well as a lot of rare blades, so gameplay spoilers at your own discretion. The first thing I'd like to say is more of y'all need to remember that field skills were in X. For some reason, a lot of the narrative around field skills in Xenoblade seems to be they introduced this thing in 2 and it was bad, and not they introduced this thing in X and it was bad, then they kept it in 2 and made it bad in a completely different way. Which I don't completely get because I've seen people who I know have played X make comments like that too. If you didn't know, field skills were introduced in X and they weren't very good there either. While 2 has a bunch of different types of skills, X only has three. Biological, archaeological, and mechanical, each of which just represents your character's knowledge in that specific field. You start out with all of them at level 1, and each can be raised by raising your blade level, which is basically a rank of how much side content you can do, weighted in different ways depending on the blade division you're in. Once a given skill is at level 4, you can undertake an intentionally cryptic side quest in order to max it out at 5. Skills in X are used for basically one thing, opening treasure chests, and each skill allows you to open a different kind of chest. Archaeological is for anything related to non-Earth civilization. Mechanical is any Earth-based stuff, either wreckage, stuff left behind by humans, stuff in NLA, or just white whale components. And biological is basically anything related to Mira's indigens, which involves digging through poop a disconcertingly large amount of times. To get rewards from a node, you just press A next to it and fill up the bar by pressing A a few more times. If you have level 5 in a skill, every bar will take only one press to fill up, which I think is a really neat extra reward in addition to being able to open max level coffers. And of course, some nodes are restricted by level, and you need that level of the respective skill in order to open it. This seems harmless if a little underbaked of a mechanic, but there are several issues with that. The first is that you need to talk to an NPC after getting each blade level increase and choose a skill to upgrade before you can get that upgrade. 
it's basically the same issue 2 has where you need to check a blade's affinity chart in order to actually get the skill upgrade, except worse because you need to fast travel to NLA and talk to a specific NPC instead of just opening up the menu you have on you at all times. The second is that unlike 2, which yes, that is a legitimate improvement 2 made, you can't see failed skill checks on the map. It doesn't record them. The only treasure chest locations that are recorded on the map are ones required to complete a segment for the survey, and sometimes those will be level 1 so you always remember to open them, but the level 3 node that is about 10 steps away from the one you needed for the segment won't be recorded on the map at all. You could argue that 2 also has this issue since unopened chests are not recorded on the map either, but if you're unable to access a chest on your first visit to an area, 99% of the time it's because you don't have the necessary field skills to get to it, and those skill checks will be recorded on the map, so that is legitimately a non-issue. The last big issue is that there's outright an illusion of choice when it comes to upgrading your field skills, and that is because mechanical is the objective best choice when it comes to your first three blade level ups and field skill upgrades. Mechanical is the only one of the three field skills that has two uses. All three skills can be used to access treasure nodes and get items from them, but mechanical is also used for installing data probes at frontier nav sites. This might not seem like a huge deal at first until you realize that for every frontier nav site you've done the skill check on, you can install a data probe, and that means a larger amount of passive income, be it moranium, money, or rare items, and the fact that you need to pass the check in order to get the skip travel point at that frontier nav location. And remember how I said that the harder to access locations are the ones that need higher skill checks? Yeah, if you find that and you don't have the right mechanical level, you'll have to go back to that hard to reach location just to be able to fast travel back there in the future. So the only good choice you can make when it comes to leveling your field skills is for blade levels two through four, you also get mechanical levels two through four. As soon as you hit mechanical four, you can pick up the side quest for mechanical five but several of the objectives for that involve either defeating really hard to find high level tyrants or scale flight. So no, you cannot immediately get the highest mechanical level as soon as you hit the second highest and you'll be waiting through most of the main story of the game in order to get those few level five fast travel points. I think most people know how field skills work in two, so I'm not going to overly explain them like I did for X's, but I am going to make one disclaimer before I talk about the issues. And that is that at least as far as the main story goes, the gotcha isn't the problem with two skill checks. There are exactly two skill checks in the entire game that cannot be passed just by using skills you get from story-required blades, including Wolfric. The only two skills you can't meet are both elemental mastery checks, which can be passed by any common blade of that element or a collection thereof. You never need to pull a gotcha rare blade in order to pass any required skill check, nor do you need the power of those gotcha blades to beat the game. The actual problem is, unfortunately, the basically everything else. While elemental mastery is a non-issue and you should never complain about that because, again, just awaken common blades, you don't need rares for that, there are plenty of exploration points and treasure chests that you do need rare blade exclusive field skills in order to unlock. On top of that is the fact that a lot of rare blades also have at least one field skill that's completely useless outside of their side quest and maybe a couple merc missions on top of that, which is just makes it kind of pointless. There's no need to even have that skill available if it doesn't give you any sort of gameplay buff. Then there's also the fact that the field skills themselves are tied to the affinity chart, which is somewhat of a clunky mechanic and may involve grinding if you want to max out every single blade. And then there's just the fact that it only pulls from blades that are in your party in order to make a check. So if you're trying to pass a check that's level 3 leaping and level 5 earth mastery, and across all the blades you've awakened you have level 5 leaping and level 10 earth mastery, you still might fail the check because you don't have 3 and 5 levels of each skill respectively engaged actively on your drivers. And when you do swap around the blades so you have the right skills on your drivers, and then pass the check, you're immediately going to forget that you did that and the next time you get in a fight you're going to get destroyed because you forgot to swap back to your good battle party. 
Then there's also the fact that there are a bunch of skill checks on ladders, but you can't open the menu on a ladder, so you have to jump off the ladder, swap your blades, and climb back up. And you can't view a skill check on the map until you've gotten to it at least once, so if you don't already have the required skills in your party, you are going to have to climb up back that ladder at least once, Snake Eater. It gets really annoying. By far, the easiest quality of life patch they could have made would be to have the field skills pull from every single blade you have with you, that is, everyone you have that isn't on a merc mission, in order to choose skills from. If they really wanted to limit it, they could still say, okay, we'll pick only three times the amount of drivers you have, but automatically choose the best ones for the skills we need and do that, but either way, it would be so much better to have to swap around. Additionally, there's the fact that barring a certain exploit, you can't remove the main story blade of each driver until New Game Plus, so technically, unless it's a skill specific to Mithra, Dromark, or the like, you're only going to have two times the amount of non-Tora drivers in your party to make skill slots from, which means it's even harder to get the right amount of skills, and you might have to grind out your common blade affinity charts even more just to pass a certain check. I do think Torna made a step in the right direction. First off, they labeled collection points better so you don't have to fish around for the right point. Second off, you don't have to engage or disengage blades at all, so as long as you have the skill leveled up properly, you will always apply that skill to a check for it. And then, of course, the removal of the gacha makes it significantly easier to have the right skills at the right time because you're limited to six blades and six blades only. There's also the fact that every single skill is exclusive to only one blade in Torna. In the base game, even among the story blades, there was some overlap, like how Rock, Poppy QT, and Pandoria all have lockpicking. So in Torna, if you fail to pass a skill check, you know exactly what skill levels you're missing, and you also know exactly what affinity chart nodes to unlock, because there's only one blade that you can level up to get the required levels in that skill. You do still have to deal with some of the affinity chart jank, but they did make leveling up nodes significantly faster in Torna, so that's also less of an issue. The best change they made though, and bear with me on this one because this isn't technically a field skill at all, is with the crafting system. Because like Torna field skills, these are abilities that are unique to each party member, but unlike Torna field skills, you don't level them up in the exact same way you level up your battle prowess. Making crafting items instead involves gathering, which while yes, is impacted by field skills, does not specifically require fighting, and you get more recipes by doing side quests and sometimes through the main story. So they're actually a reward for exploring and doing more, rather than a gate preventing you from doing any exploration that's largely locked behind grinding and good RNG. Obviously some of this is subverted by Torna being Torna, but that's kind of beside the point. Lastly, Adam and Hugo's crafts aren't pouch items like the rest. They are key items, and Hugo even gains the ability to craft something that does give you another field skill by enabling more collection points. So I think this type of thing is a good basis for how field skills should work in the future. My idea for field skills goes a little bit further though, so I'll try to explain. Basically, tie every field skill to a specific party member, and not anything like a blade if the next game has one. Make sure that even if you haven't leveled them up at all, you at least have access to all of your field skills as long as you just have all of the party members the story gives you. If the next game is an X situation and has optional party members, then just make sure that none of them are permanently missable and that no story required field skill checks rely on the optional party members because in that case they're not really optional at all. Then split the skills into passive and active categories. Passive things would be where all of your shop deeds from Xenoblade 2 slash Adam and Hugo key items would go, as well as things that unlock new collection points. I'm thinking that, say, you can't get fish by checking water until you have a party member who's a fisherman, and since this is a JRPG, there's obviously going to be a party member who fishes, so basically all that field skill does is these fishing nodes will show up once this character joins the party, and if you level up that skill, you can just get better fish or a higher number yield, basically like all of the gathering related skills in 2 did. And also for passive skills, I would say that once you unlock a skill and get it to a certain level, even if the character that skill comes from leaves the party temporarily, you'll still have access to that skill. So going back to the fisherman example, if he has to leave the party and go do something else for like one chapter or one story arc or whatever, you're not completely locked out of doing any fishing because that would also screw over side quests or other stuff like that. So just do that as a quality of life thing, even if the narratively it doesn't make any sense. 
and obviously you need to wait for that character to rejoin the party in order to keep leveling up the field skill. On the other hand, I want active field skills to be completely different to how they are in X and 2. And the main difference is, I want you to be able to target on the overworld a field skill check, the same way you would target an enemy, as long as you're out of battle. That way you don't accidentally target the tree branch that you can cut down or burn or whatever while you're in the middle of fighting Rotbart, because that would just be terrible game design. And from then on, basically make it sort of like a Metroidvania, in that if you press the engage button while you're targeting a field skill check and not an enemy, you get a different arts palette, and this one just consists of all the field skills you've unlocked so far. Then, based on your knowledge of the skills you have, what your characters are capable of, and what you think those skills do, what you've seen them do in the past, you can just pick whichever skill you think would work on that checkpoint and try it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and maybe one of your other skills doesn't. And then, of course, I have a bunch of quality of life things that need to be said, assuming the skill checks are similar to Xenoblade 2. So, as an example, let's just say that there is a boulder covered in ice that needs Fire Mastery level 3 and Super Strength level 5 in order to clear, move out of the way, and give you access to a treasure chest or whatever. When you target it, in place of the usual enemy HP meter, it will instead display the name of the thing, so I guess just Ice Boulder, and then blank level 3 and blank level 5. So initially, it won't tell you which skills you need, but it will tell you the amount of skills, and it will tell you the level of skills. As soon as you target the skill checkpoint, that much is registered on your map for viewing at any point in the future. So, then you open the arts palette and look around through your field skills. Clearly, it's covered in ice, so you're going to want to use Fire Mastery. Let's say you have level 4 Fire Mastery, so that goes through no problem. That is recorded both on the little tag in place of the enemy info, and again on your map, and again, just like in Xenoblade 2, it will outright display, yes, you already have the Fire Mastery required for this part of the check. And then for the level 5 skill, looking around at all your skills you have at level 5 or above, you think, oh, maybe I could wash it away with the Water Mastery. Now, while it might be a cool idea to give you multiple ways to solve a certain environmental puzzle like this, I think that might be too much for what Xenoblade is trying to do, and more something that Monolith should work on putting in Breath of the Wild instead, so the Water Mastery is not going to work. The skill is going to fail, and it's not going to record anything on the tag or on the map. Then you use Super Strength, it records that, and it just does the skill. One obvious quality of life feature is that if you have the Super Strength but it's only level 4, and you input it, then it will record that it's Super Strength, but it won't do the check, so you can go back on your map and see, okay, that's a skill check that I haven't done, what does it need? Oh, Super Strength, I just need to level that up, and you can go and come back. I think Two other quality of life things would be dependent on whether or not the skill is a one-use thing, like digging up a treasure chest, moving that boulder, or something like that, or a multiple-use thing, like all of the Xenoblade 2 ladder skill checks that were used. If it's a single-use thing, if you have one of the skills and you enter that properly, then that is saved in that skill check, even if you disengage from the target, leave the area, and come back. So if you have the Fire Mastery already, you input the Fire Mastery already, and you know that you just need one level of Super Strength, you can leave, level up the Super Strength, come back, and you won't need to input Fire a second time. Now, obviously, just for visual purposes, I think that unless it's a multi-stage check, like Unleashing Curadil is in 2, then it will still only show the animation once you input everything, so it won't melt the ice and then you can back out and the ice will stay melted. It'll do all of that at once, because I think it would be a lot of extra animation work otherwise. But just as a quality of life thing, you don't need to enter the same skill multiple times. On the other hand, for multi-use skill checks, as long as you've passed the check once, you don't even need to input field skills whatsoever any other time you want to use that feature. So say you climb that ladder once with your wind mastery and your leaping or whatever, all you need to do the next time you want to climb that ladder is target the skill check, and instead of the engage or open skill check palette option or whatever, your engage option will just be activate check, and it will just do it automatically without you needing to input anything else. Now, obviously, depending on what the actual in-universe context of the field skill check is, you will probably still need to walk right up next to it to actually use the field skills on it, but if one of your characters gets like a hook shot or something, then you would actually be able to target a faraway thing and use a field skill from a distance. Also, maybe you need to, say, freeze a lake to get across it, and the freezing point is actually on the opposite side of the lake, so you have to target something far away from you and use the skill from a distance. Now, as for how you'd acquire these skills, 
Obviously, some party members would just straight up have them to begin with, and you would use stuff like that for the required field skill checks in order to pass through the story, and others would be unlocked like the additional crafting options in Torna, either by doing side quests or by progressing through the main story. So instead of having to grind stuff out or wait around in order to explore better, you naturally get better exploration tools as you progress through the game or as rewards for doing side content outside of the main story. The only real issue that comes from this is the fact that you might still have to level up field skills in order to progress through the story, and I do think it would be a bad idea to make field skill points a separate resource you earn from winning battles or something and then you spend that to upgrade skills, because that would easily require a lot of grinding just in order to unlock a certain skill threshold. Like, say your main character has three different skills, and you put all your field skill points into one of them, but now you need level two of the second and the third in order to pass through a certain required skill checkpoint, that just wouldn't work very well and would require you to basically grind out enemies and possibly screw over your overpoweredness. So I think that would be a bad idea. As much as I've been ragging on it, I do think a better implemented version of the Xenoblade 2 affinity chart is still the best way to go and just make the unlocks for the story required field skills significantly easier. Like, instead of doing X amount of side quests or doing X specific side quests or gathering X amount of X specific item, make those the easy ones that you can do basically whenever. Like, those are the kill X amount of certain enemy ones, those are the discover certain location ones, or the kill a certain unique monster and not one with difficult spawn conditions ones. So, if you miss a story required check, it might only take you a few minutes to unlock as opposed to a few hours for some of the more difficult ones that are only used for high-end optional exploration and that kind of thing. There's one side quest in Xenoblade 1 that I really like, and I think this type of field skill would actually be really conducive to making more situations like that. In Machina Forest, there are a bunch of bridges over a big river that comprises basically the central point of the explorable map. In your first visit, there is at least one significantly sized area that you're not going to have access to because the bridge to that part is down. Later on in the story, you visit the other part of the map by going in from a different area, and you can then do a side quest to get that bridge repaired and make it easier to cross over. So I think that if we're tying exploration, side quests, and field skills together, they should do a lot more things like that, where you can explore around by walking or something, and then at the end of that explorable area, you can then use a field skill to unlock a shortcut back that you can go and it's a lot quicker than doing the intensive exploration or maybe just a skip travel point if you don't want to do stuff like that either. And then maybe now that you've opened up an easier way to that area, once you've done a certain side quest, now a certain NPC will move to that area and give you more stuff or unlock more quests. Or maybe you could have pseudo escort missions where you need to go around and open the easy way for a certain more vulnerable NPC or something like that. Or maybe one who just can't make that field skill check because they don't have that expertise. It opens up a lot more interesting side quest possibilities and could make exploration a lot more streamlined. And then one other thing I thought of, I am actually a really big fan of the Xenoblade 2 version of collection points, where you always get the exact same type of item from a specific point, and obviously the way Torn did it is better, where they straight up marked, this is the type of item you'll get from this point, so I think it might be a decent idea to lock certain collection points in certain areas that give certain rare items behind field skill checks, so say the Banshoon Sea Bream is a rare fish collectible in whatever the ocean area is in the next Xenoblade game. And you need a few of them for a certain side quest, and you might also need them to craft something or trade in for something at a shop. What you could do is just walk around throughout the different fishing collection points and hope you get lucky, or you could read the quest flavor text that talks about there being a special fishing hole, and then look around by the edge of the ocean, find a field skill check, maybe a diving one or knocking down some rocks or getting some plants out of the way or whatever, that allows you to find a new fishing hole, and that fishing hole has a higher chance of getting the Banshoon Sea Bream. So you can use the side quest to give you an idea of where you can get a certain rare item better, and then when you need that certain rare item for other things later on in the game, you already know where that fishing hole is and can go get that. I do think that if they want to do something like that, they should, one, bring the Collectopedia back so you know exactly how many items of each type are available in an area, and two, if different collection nodes of the same species are going to have different probabilities for different things, I think that should also be noted on the map. So say there are five different fish 
One fishing hole gives four of them, one fishing hole gives five of them, one fishing hole gives five of them, but at different probabilities. It will list that on the map. Those will fill in with the probabilities once you collect those items and register them in the Collectopedia, and it also makes farming even easier. So that's not even a field skill thing, that's just a nice quality of life thing that they should also add. And lastly, we have new movement options. I sort of touched on this before, but the idea of maybe your character will get a hookshot type thing as a field skill and you can use that to access areas, but I think just general movement things would be good too. Obviously, if this is an X game or any other game where you just straight up get vehicles, then a lot of this is going to be invalid, but I do think either a subset of passive field skills or a third category of field skills that gives increased movement options would be a neat thing to also enhance exploration. You might have heard me talk about this before because I mentioned stuff like this slightly, including even the active field skills, I believe, in the video where I accidentally predicted Future Connected, and that was basically give you a car so you can move around flat areas fast, and give you a glide so you can jump off things and do cooler stuff like that. Again, X not having fall damage sort of invalidates that, but I don't know, maybe fall damage reduction could also be a passive field skill since Xenoblade 2's environments were based a lot around falling down, and something like that would also make the downtime where you're just waiting to replenish HP so you can jump off a second thing a lot shorter. One of my other concepts for that whole Future Connected idea was to make Melia's elemental summons also give you a certain field skill, and instead of starting with all of them like you do in FC, you gain them throughout the story, and maybe some of them are locked behind side quests because Shulk had a couple Monado arts like that in the base game of Xenoblade 1. Basically, each elemental summon would also give you a field skill. Some of them would be active, like obviously Summon Flare is just going to be fire mastery and allow you to burn things, but Summon Wind could either be a sprint function, like please put the Xenoblade X sprint into the numbered Xenoblade games, even if you're not going to put scales in, or like a double jump or something like that, so that in addition to gaining combat prowess, you also gain utility prowess in a way that logically makes sense with your character's new abilities. Like, Xenoblade 2 probably has some of the best animated cutscenes I've ever seen in a game, and the best combat choreography in cutscenes I've ever seen, and none of that translates to gameplay. Your main character, Rex, is extremely acrobatic and literally has a grappling hook he can hang from, and yet the only time you can use the hook in gameplay is via a glorified collection point, and you can't do any of the acrobatics in combat, let alone just in exploring the open world. So I think just giving you interesting movement options for just going around the overworld that match what your character's powers are makes sense and maybe might get rid of some weird story and gameplay segregation. And in addition to that, obviously the car being a better sprint is a kind of funny thing, but that would obviously also only work on things like roads and deserts and other flat areas. So I think if you're going to have characters who have access to technology and know how to use technology, then that should be a thing you're allowed to use. And it's absolutely criminal that we were not able to drive Juju's buggy at all in either the post game of Definitive Edition or in Future Connected. I know this is kind of petering out like most of my unscripted videos do, but these are basically my thoughts on fixing field skills in future Xenoblade games and slightly hinting at the option to add new movement opportunities for characters also based on field skills or their combat power. That's all I got for this time. I don't know which video on the list I'm making next, but until then, I am Luxon, signing off.